So, good evening. Thank you uh, for the invitation tonight. I am really uh, impressed about this wonderful uh, big hall. I never was in a concert hall giving a lecture, but uh, I'm really glad that I don't have to sing. So, somehow, I will try to do my best, hoping that you will listen to me very well, but this should be in a concert hall. Uh, we're living in a more or less interesting world now, interesting moment, because uh, obviously uh, all the established orders are changing. Probably Asia will be becoming the global leader, and America will become number two. And probably also the relations in between America and Europe will change in a way that uh, can be dramatically because of new orientation. You would say this is normal and uh, this is something that happens and is proved so much in history, but uh, it's different if one is part of this uh, event and one is, uh, in the, one is uh, really touched by these, uh, by these changings. So change is something that uh, is now a word that we hear a lot. We hear a lot about crisis and financial and real estate crisis. And we hear a lot about change. On one side, that we have to have ready to be able to change or have the necessary agility to change, whatever. On the other side, as normal people are feeling, they hope for stability or for safety. So this is something very contradictory what is going on. And I think it's rather similar in architecture. Uh, this is nothing new in architecture, talking about stability or about change. Let's say the new things happening in architecture, where does they come from? We have the engagements of universities in research, fundamental research, applied research, whatever. A lot of so-called innovation is uh, is going on, people are asking for that on one side, it's a part of economics as well, and on the other side we have in architecture the stability, we have that what is, has overcome for years, for generations as an experience, as an experience in practice, that is so much important because as architects on one side you have to be innovative, on the other side you have to give guarantees for that what you are doing, so you have to be uh, responsible for your work and uh, clients are looking for guarantees. So we are in between always this, uh, this uh, changing game in between doing something new or hold something very stable. I think I'm now just 22 years in practice of architecture and uh, I have to say that our profession uh, really changed in a lot of ways. Since I started as a student, there has happened a lot of things that for me were not uh, predictable. On the other side, I would not say that uh, the building processes have, or let's say the building process have become more complicated. But I would not say that it is because of technical complications. It's more because of the increasing number of stakeholders or uh, specialists that are sharing often the planning process as well as the realization phase in a way that uh, as an architect you have to redefine the rule that you are playing uh, or that you want to take over taking your responsibility in that what you are doing. So. Uh, for example, in Switzerland, we have a lot of uh, solving of problems to solve now, engaging, engaged in uh, questions of energy efficiency. We have several energy standards that have increased. The, uh, the laws that were fulfilling these uh, standards and for public building, for example, we have to do new standards that were totally different from that what 10 years ago was the rules of construction. And so it became more and more that uh, 
I had to deal in between that what is going on in practice and my engagement at the university as a teacher for construction, architecture and construction. Uh, I never wanted to write a book about that, but somehow the stuff increased, more and more papers, more and more handouts, and at a certain point we decided, me and my team, decided to make a book about that to hold something together like the guidelines of a profession. I think it's important that we have to rethink our profession because slightly the tendencies are clear. I see a lot of students coming out of, from the schools. Yeah, they are conceptualists. I like to, to have a good idea in the beginning of every project. I mean, if you, have, if you have a plan, that's very good. If you have a good plan, that's better. But if you have no plan for a project, you have really a problem. So starting with an idea that is clear, this is something of the most important. But nowadays, I would say it's not only having an idea, but it's more or less to know how to bring the idea also in the whole, uh, through every obstacles that you have to overwhelm in the practice through to realization. And this is what uh, we think is important that we should look for, that we should care for in the, in the schools, in educationing the students, for example, in construction. I think this is a question of competence, a question of professionality. And uh, more and more, I see around, uh, looking around different schools that I know very well in Europe, I see that our profession is more and more shifting towards something that is called think tank. So the first 10% uh, of, uh, of a phase that uh, is dedicated to having a good idea, to bring out good ideas. But then suddenly uh, uh, a lot of work will be done by specialists that uh, came in this, this, uh, this whole procedure in a way that you can't avoid it because of a lack of professionality on the architect's side on one side. On the other side, it has to become more complicated, more stakeholders, so you can't do everything by your own. So it is a game, gaming in between. What can you do as an architect? What has you to delegate? And how to bring over the ideas also, and, and with, with success, also in the practice, in the realization of a project. I will show you tonight four projects as examples, I choose them for showing you several aspects. I don't explain you everything about the projects. I focus on several points that are yeah, underlying what I'm trying to say you now in this introduction. I mean, when uh, nowadays, uh, I would say we are talking about core and shell. This is something that has become a terminus. Core and shell. Architects are dealing with the core, with the structure of a building, more or less pragmatic, more or less uh, the bare loaded construction combined with several other devices. But then at a certain point, there come, are coming specialists. Even for, let's say, the finishing, the working out of architecture, there are a lot of specialists that uh, bring in their own knowledge, but they are influencing the project directly. We are calling, we're talking about interior design, which sounds very normally nowadays for us. We have to remark that this is a, a domain that belongs to architecture. I could not say where to split it up from that, what the whole idea would uh, maintain. On the other side, it's not so much the problem with the structures. There are some architects trying to stabilize the projects to, by choosing uh, extravagant structures, often bare loaded constructions that are so fixed that you can't move that in any way. So helping or supporting the idea in a way that uh, you can fix, you can stabilize the idea against uh, later, later uh, uh, changes. 
I think on the other side, and this is what we feel now in Switzerland very, very hard, the impact of thermodynamics, the whole discussion about building physics, discussion about energy efficiency provoked something that started in the 70s and is, not, is ongoing since now uh, by bringing out a total out of thinking about that what, what, for example, a facade of a building is. Younger people, younger students in your rows probably uh, don't uh, know the, the, the time when you could, when you could dare to construct something in one shell. So when you could say, okay, a building is what it is, it is made in concrete, for example, the outside is the similar part as the inside, and that's more or less okay. This was 1960 before uh, the oil uh, shock. But now we have learned that, uh, we have to div uh, that we have to split up the whole construction in shells. In a bare loaded shell inside, in an insulation shell, and in a protecting skin or protecting shell outside. And somehow this has to fit together mechanically. What we learned is that uh, in the expression, in the architectural, let's say, fundamental understanding of that what architecture is, a tectonic construction of walls and ceilings and so on, it is not so clear anymore. You can say it's the same like the in interior design uh, uh, development, we can talk about, or we can name it now as an exterior design that is going on. It's very simple. We see the increasing uh, thick shells of insulation packages enveloping the interior structures, and we see that the protecting skins have to become more and more thin because they are uh, eccentrically, more and more eccentrically, eccentrically uh, fixed from the bellow, the construction part, and they have to be lightweighted as much as possible. So somehow, buildings are changing totally their expression. That's what the architectural theory, or let's say, uh, the whole uh, uh, range of, uh, of uh, historic perceiving of architecture named the Swiss box, has nothing to do with a stylish interest. I'm totally convinced that, for example, the development in Switzerland towards these Swiss boxes are only dedicated to this high impact of thermodynamic and the whole splitting up of the facade. Before, you could do plasticity, absolutely complex, formal and, uh, and uh, structural work, after, after the impact of the splitting up of the facade, you have to reduce the whole complexity to more or less straight walls. So something dedicated to a very pragmatic way for uh, reaching solutions under the given frame of costs. So this sounds not really sexy, but I guess this is more the truth than every discussion about what then reduction, minimalism and so on has provoked in publications. So somehow, if, let's say, if this is true, what I'm saying, it could be interesting to work out possibilities to, to find other solutions, to find other ways. If 90% are dealing with that, uh, the 10% left over could be very interesting to play on. And what I'm interested in, besides good ideas in architecture, is how to make the piano as broad as possible for the arch architectural work. So I'm interested in to find out solutions not to have only a narrow piano, but a broad, the broadest possible piano you can play. This is what I'm interested in and why I try to bring that over also in books like this architecture construction. An early example in a very, yeah, it's a village it's a village uh, near the axis between Zurich and Graubünden. This is the mountain area in Switzerland, in the south of Zurich. A lot of people every weekend are traveling towards this region. 
Um, this village is uh, situated one kilometer beside this axis, but hidden by a forest, as you see. And this is the good sake of this village. It has never been discovered by the people. So a lot of people are not knowing that this, uh, that this village with the name Flash is existing. We had there uh, the occasion to build a small house for a family. Now, the very interesting thing is that this village is really an organic, an organic uh, whole. So the whole architecture is dedicated to urbanism. The streets are produced by the houses and not in the other way around. The houses are built in stone, massive, plasticity, everything what you know in architecture very well, very self-understanding, nothing stylish, nothing that is dedicated to special interests. It's something that is, let's, let's say, that what is the overcome in architecture. Very sane, very actual, and people are living there. So it's not only a museum, it's, it's, it's a, a living village with inhabitants, looking and caring for this village. So we had to think about that fact. We wanted to add a house as a part of the whole body of this village, and not only to uh, bring in some special house as the wish of a client. We had the luck that this house is situated at the border. I hope you see the small red dot here. Uh, at the border of the village, that means uh, outside it begins the rural landscape. A lot of wine yards. This uh, village is famous for the wine. Nobody knows the, where the village really is situated mostly, but the wine is very famous. So one of the best wines in Switzerland are coming from this village. You see the house is positioned uh, directly at the, at the narrow street here. It's not really true. We had to enlarge the street to the house because of the building laws. The building laws forced us to make three meters of distance to the existing uh, existing road. So something like a, a, a mistake in the building law because here typically you as architects suddenly would discover this by uh, making a, a small walk through the village. You would suddenly discover that all the streets are formed by the positions of the houses and not in the other way around. But this is uh, something that happens if uh, not professionals are thinking about urban conditions and urban qualities in such, also in such small places that seems to be not so important to care for. You see the house is a concrete house, uh, a roof, an entrance, some openings, not really complicated, not really uh, high remarkable. It is that what it is. We liked, we wanted to find out how we could find solutions to work out something that is made like it seems and is made, let's say, in the attitude like the existing houses, but in another materiality. So it's clear, we could not say, let's make a house in one shell of concrete and we forget building, physician, building physics and building physicians and we forget everything about energy. So we had to find out how to deal with that material. Normal concrete is not possible because of the bad insulation value. Uh, we had in that time a school under construction and there we, uh, we found the material uh, that we used for the insulation of the platform before uh, building the, or let's say rising, let's, uh, before rising the building up in the height, we found some material, some uh, pebbles or some pieces of foamed glass. And we got in contact with uh, this uh, uh, producer of this material and we asked him if he could mix that in a way that we could uh, find out a new quality for this kind of concrete. 
So why? We were interested in, in that what for us is something very, very normal. I mean, architecture can be very, has a body, has, has a core, can be massive, can be very powerful. Even if there is no architect uh, or no well-known architect, for example, this uh, house here, I don't know if there exists ever, ever, if there ever was an architect in charge of uh, the planning of this house, but if you're looking at that house, you see this is a really, really powerful house, very traditional on one side, but also reduced and focused on fundamental question in architecture. What is a building? How, it is, how is it built? In which materiality? In, and in which construction? And so on. How are the openings assembled together that you get something like a whole body of architecture? And others followed them uh, in the near, in the, in the later time, uh, preceders and followers in a way that it's always going on, this question that is interesting for us, how to work out an architectural project in a way that it, it cares for this fundamental uh, qualities that architecture can have. Now this uh, mixture of uh, foam glass pieces uh, allowed to have one single shell for this building. You see, uh, you see here an example, we, we made tests, you see it's 2000, so it's a long time ago. Uh, we replaced all pebbles and sand in the concrete by these pieces, different sizes of piece of foam glass, so to get something like a fuller curve, an ideal distribution of different sizes of these pieces, to have also an, in, an, an, an affordable insulation value. In the outside you see it's, sorry, in the outside you see it's concrete, it looks like concrete, you see the frame, you see the, the, the form work of, uh, uh, in, in wood, so the texture of the, of the wooden form work. You see the gray, the symmetry matrix of the concrete. Everything looks very normal, but inside you have more or less symmetric matrix and glass. So I could also say this is a glass house, but it's not transparent. In, in effect, chemically, it's totally diverse from everything that you know under the title of concrete. It's total, behaving totally different, it's, it's drying totally different, and it's behaving after uh, the, the forming uh, during the whole uh, lifetime. It's, it's behaving different. And this was not known in that moment. So we had to care for the questions, what would happen, what, what could be the baddest damage that happens, and how does our client then uh, react on that? Is he in charge? Are we in charge? Or who is responsible for that? And we made a contract. We could, we could convince the client that he agreed to say, okay, I'm with you, I support you in this idea, with this idea of a single shell, a simple house, uh, but I have to have no damage if something happens. And we made a contract with the, uh, with the producer of this material, we made a contract with the builder and with our engineer and us in a special society that we found it for the worst case uh, that could happen because insurances are not uh, filling the gap for, in this question. So somehow we had to organize ourselves, but this was the chance that we could start. You see, the inside, this is the same material, inside only uh, painted in white chalk uh, color. So you have the inside uh, texture of the formwork as well as the outside. One shell, the windows very simply uh, put uh, in the openings from the inside. Uh, and a high uh, space quality in, in, in a case, in a, in a several sense of plasticity. This was what we wanted, not more, and uh, this was the chance that uh, was given to us that we could start with this client. You see it here, 
the outside, come in, to the inside, very simple detailing, absolutely not complicated in that sense. So this was a first step in to say, okay, um, somehow it's clear, there are rules of the knowledge how to build. There are rules given by the practice, by the architectural association with, uh, with uh, normative underlayings or with uh, the practice of the lawyers that had to, uh, had to fight against uh, uh, architects, they made failures and so on. So who is really uh, formulating the rules of construction? This is something that is going on and how to behave in this frame to have opportunities that we want, or that we could use if we are leaving this way that we are trained to do. So we all learned in the school that it has to be this and this and this way. And we had to, let's say, to overwhelm this pre-knowledge or this, uh, let's say, this, this, this meaning about what we should do to make the next step. But also being aware that we are responsible for that and this is not a house, not an experimentation going in an unsure future. We have to care for this client that he is not coming under, under pressure. So, this is the start. We, this was something that we did in the practice, in the office. I then tried to do a research work with the producer of this material and there we, we got a squirrel because the, the producer wanted immediately to bring in the whole material in the market, in the broad market. He wanted to promote this material and I said, okay, there are so much questions open, for example, how does this miscellaneous of symmetry matrix and glass react under uh, the adding of water? You can imagine that uh, rain or snow or whatever, f uh, freezing water is probably a problem for this uh, miscellaneous material. And uh, we, should, we should work out that in a serious uh, research work. Even if it is adapted uh, research, it has to be fulfilled in a very, very classical way. But he didn't want to. And uh, the effect was that several architects, not knowing about these problems that used the material three, two or three years later, had then to fight with lawyers about damages that, that happened. So he had to step back and to work out uh, uh, this, all these questions, like we said in the beginning. But we could prevent a lot of problems by thinking about and being careful how to use it. This is the same village, only on the other side of this wood. It's a winery we did for another client. It's, I would say it's the best wine producer that you can get, that we will find in, in Switzerland. He is doing uh, really uh, nice wines, wines from the quality like, like Burgund wines, so absolutely amazing. But it's a very, very normal guy, so he has both leg on the earth. He is someone who is used to work out what he wants, having clear ideas, thinking about what he wants, and then uh, starting up with the realization process. So it's a winery, it's an extension of something that he, not he himself did, but uh, a friend of him. It's, let's say, uh, a piece of architecture, very unspectacular, but it is a fact, it was there, something like a fragment, something like uh, uh, a not fulfilled uh, piece of architecture, no courtyard, we then added the whole building here on this side to, to formulate something like a courtyard, courtyard uh, complex. You see in the plan the existing house uh, with this uh, uh, additional building and we uh, built up new this hall, this hall here and a connection in the underground. Under the, under the outside place, we connected the building with 
a bigger wine cellar. This is uh, important to understand because uh, the layout of this section shows you what happens. It's very simple. Uh, the wine grapes are brought in in autumn. They are put in uh, containers, in oak containers, and then after several time the wine flows by gravity down in the next containers, in the next step of this procedure until uh, then it will leave the house uh, on the, in, the, in the ground floor in the expedition. So very simple aggregate, nothing complicated. Uh, it was important for us that our client said, I hate machines, I, don't, I, I will not pump the wine up and down. The wine has to flow uh, very regularly, like gravitation is working, and uh, this is it. So you see, in total, more or less empty halls and rooms, and they are used, depending from the steps of the working steps with the wine, uh, from the actual work that has to be done. So sometimes this hall is totally empty uh, and you can use it for a party and other times it is full with oak containers and then it happens often something new. So more or less it is a simple program to have a winery if you are not thinking about a machine. If you want to have a machine you can build a machine and then you have to make spectacular turnarounds with the wine and so on. But this was not the case here. You see the new hall, you see there is uh, enough light inside. This is not because of the wine, but because of people, men who are working here. And uh, you see that it is uh, a facade that is dedicated with, with open joints in a way that you can have a control ventilation, natural ventilation inside to the rooms, which is also important, uh, not for the wine directly, but for the gas that is going away. So you have to, to look that, that you have good working conditions. This is more or less the point with uh, is from importance. The plan in the ground floor, you see uh, the wine cellar, you see the the old, the old cellar here. You see the connections with the mushroom column hall. Uh, underneath uh, the, the, the hall itself, you see the expedition here, and you see two tunnel-like wine cellars digged in the depth of the slope of the terrain. Some impressions here, and also here you see it's an empty room, can be totally empty, can be filled with glass and the machines too. Uh, close the bottles or to uh, fix the, the etiquette, etiquettes, no idea what it names is, uh, to the bottles. <clears throat> and the special program here was the roof. So this is not part of the winery itself, but it was the wish that there should be a roof, a roof uh, covered with a uh, um, no, it's a terrace, sorry, it's a terrace here, an open terrace on the top of the hall, covered with a roof, but open when the weather is nice, the temperature warm, so there are only two closed rooms here, a lounge and several uh, service rooms, and in between the possibility to, to test the wine and to have a nice uh, meal. So uh, it's something like a restaurant, but not really. It's, more, it's not officially a restaurant, but you could eat there or could drink their wine if you have an announcement or make a reservation for them. For us, uh, it was a nice program. And you see it here. You can have, uh, after, after the wine, you can have uh, a short uh, uh, break, uh, you can uh, feel free to look over the vineyards, a really nice occasion here as a, as a, a surplus, something that was not needed but became more and more from interest for the client. So until here I only explained to you the, the program, you see it's a simple program. 
Um, we wanted to have a simple building because there we don't have to fulfill the same uh, uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, preconditions like in a normal building, like in a house, in a family single a single family house or in a in a in a in a for a flat or so on we we only had to look for the best conditions for a work room combined with the fact that the wine has to be uh, more or less uh, left uh, left over at, to it, to itself so the best thing our client said is not to move the wine if you don't have to but uh, somehow we were interested, and this is the start-up of a research project that we began again at the university site. We did some experimentation with students about masonry, using bricks. And we were fascinated about the typology of, uh, let's say, stables. So these uh, pillar stables that you see in North Italia, in the, in, the, in the Lombardy. So uh, something that is a rural building, economically driven, not, nothing else than that, pragmatically understood as something that you need to work out this uh, wine. On the other side, we wanted to explore the possibilities of the masonry. And we started a collaboration with the students first, bringing out some, uh, some results, and then continued with some uh, colleagues of mine, Gramazio and Kohler, and their uh, robot work. And it was really a good, a good moment when we started with the project, and we just brought in all these masonry elements before uh, the wine was collected in order. You see some fabrication uh, images. This is a DTA. See, the machine is doing the intelligent work while uh, the support is not very clever, but we are not dealing with uh, the optimizing of industrial processes. This is something else. We are interested in how to use the, fa the, the rules of uh, masonry uh, tectonic in, let's say, another way by support of digital data. This is what we were really interested in. This is a special kind of prefabrication of masonry pieces, masonry wall pieces. And if you look close to the whole facade, putting element by element together, you see something like, a, like an image on the facade.
So what is from interest is not at the end the image that you saw on this uh, brick facade. From interest was that we found out that we have total control in the way how these uh, brick walls are made. So we could control the distance of the joints, the open joints, because of questions of natural ventilation. We could, uh, let's say, uh, control this, wear more and wear less. We could also control the impact of natural light by uh, changing these distances. And what is really special in that masonry work is every brick is laying in a total other position uh, than the other one. And the overlapping of the bricks underneath and above are every time different. So, in effect, it was the best proof, and the image on the facade was the best proof that we can use the digital data that we are working with every day in planning, in making plans, assembling more and more information of our specialists that we have in the team. So, if you have such, then we are collecting this information together. We are charging the planning more and more with information. And this is very interesting because at that certain point, you as an architect cannot be a void in the further project because your data are driving even the machines for production. This was very important to understand and also for the students to understand that they are suddenly also in the realization part of a project and not only think tanks leaving over the ideas then to the specialists coming uh, next in the row. The image of this, some people ask what is it, maybe bowls, maybe wine grapes, that's not from interest. The image is only the proof that it is possible to control something under using several parametric preconditions to, uh, that you bring in in the whole process. And the nice uh, thing in, in behind this all is that uh, it is a very archaic technique. It is masonry, normally made hand by hand, put brick by brick. Uh, imagine if you would have to position every brick in the special situation it has to be to bring out something like an all over texture over the facade. It would be, it needed months to do so because you have a plan and every measure of every brick has to be calculated by hand. So this was an important experience with the students uh, that we made before then we could start to the project of the Monte Rosa, which I will show you at the end. In between, uh, we proceeded with our question, with our interest in uh, how to stabilize an idea against uh, misusing it in the future by people who are not trained uh, how to deal with a building or because uh, there are different interests. How to, how to improve uh, an idea in a way that it will be strong enough against uh, difficult or problematic interventions. It's a city not far away from Flash. We did an insurance building there it's for an insurance company. It's a, a normal office house, not really uh, remarkable in that sense, a lot of glass. And uh, still, you see uh, uh, some uh, uh, curtains behind. It's a, a, an office building that allowed us to, to think about uh, questions like uh, how to use the sun not only to enlighten the rooms, but also to get the warmth inside of the rooms. This building has absolutely no air condition. We installed uh, some flaps that are opening, driven by an electronic-driven system. And uh, we have sensors in the building that are measuring the CO2 concentration. So if people are together, like you now, and, and uh, under the ceiling, we would now measure a lot of CO2. This is very normal. And we could so dedicate or indicate where people are just working in the moment. And so the system can drive and open those flaps that are necessary to have the best balance of uh, natural circulation. 
In winter time, we can use, or in winter, spring, autumn, we can use the warmth that is coming in by the sun and distributed by natural ventilation. In summer, we can use the night cooling uh, to look for an agreeable temperature inside. So, something not very complicated. We, we liked the idea not to use the normal uh, air condition, knowing that in 90% of the cases, this is the normal case. If you have a, 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 a building with a lot of glass, you have to, to organize the interior climate in a way that you have no overheating in the summer. This is the real problem. What we had or what we found out as a, as a problem is that we, you do a building in glass and in the next step you have to think about how to close it again in every, uh, in every way. So to protect the inside from too much sun, from overheating. And we found out that this is really a delicate problem, something that normally went forgotten. You don't see it, but these are uh, uh, fabric, uh, uh, fabric uh, pieces that are driving out and protecting the rooms inside. What is the problem? If you have wind, 30 uh, kilometers per hour around that, you have to take them in, otherwise they will be destroyed by the wind. And so several systems you can use, as well as shutters. Shutters are possible, but not really nice to see. Uh, you know that uh, very well in all these uh, examples. So you have somehow to deal with a strange thing. On one side you are doing a full glass building, on the other side you have to think about how to close it totally. Something like a contradictionary uh, handling of a problem. We had the opportunity to plan an extension for the same company because they were successful, they growed, whatever. They sell the uh, existing building here in the plan and they decided to build a new one here and we started with uh, the fact that we wanted to have uh, let's say a more massive building we wanted to have something that has again more plasticity not thin skin more plasticity in a way that there is a body there are that are corners and angles fixed by material, not opened in that sense. But on the other side, it's clear, it's an office building. So we tried to have the most possible openings that you could imagine, but not doing a grid. Normally you are making a grid produced or caused by column, rhythm of columns and the ceilings and the, the structural openings you are filling up with glass again. We, didn't want to proceed in that way, but we were interested in, 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 in the simple fact that, uh, I mean, most, most architecture is uh, driven by the fact that it, is ha that it has more floors than only one. So you are extending, let's say, the square meters of the ground uh, in the height. This is the principle of making floors, otherwise it would not make sense. And we tried out how to give this simple fact an expression. So the stapling of floors, one floor on the next one, in a way that it is becoming uh, part of the idea for a simple building like an office building. There is, again, a lot of glass, but now on the inside of these openings, shadowed also by the elements, and uh, so we proceeded. On the other side, we knew that uh, in an office building you have the problem of acoustics. You have uh, a lot of problems that are uh, mostly for students, not really uh, casual uh, in, in their own project as long as you are studying. But suddenly you have to handle with fire protections and the uh, distance of uh, the way to the next staircase in, in case of uh, fire whatever, and as well of handling in, in, the, in, in an office building because of acoustics. And then you have a absolutely high impact of building technology. And we didn't, again, we did not want to install a machine, a ventilation, air conditioning machine or whatever, 
the client has made have made a very nice experience with with this building here so they wished to continue with this uh, organized natural ventilation and they didn't wish to uh, change the system towards an air conditioned system they even proceeded to say that the people in the company have to deal themselves with the window flaps so it sounds rather strange because this is the situation before 60s when you open the window let in fresh air and close it when you have enough air but this was the beginning of all these machines to control how to do that in a way that you are not losing the energy what is the what is the fact the people learned how to deal with that in this building here here a computer was driving the flaps making them open or closing them uh, when it was a f when it was necessary so if the temperature fall or if uh, the, uh, or if the co2 concentration was uh, brought away the flaps or the computer reacted and, and drive those flaps who were necessary that were necessary to install a balance in the building the people had the whole performance on the screen the working station on the computer so they could also open a flat if they wanted but the system intervened when it was wrong so it was like driving a car you have a navigation system you can drive the wrong way as long as the voice is telling you you should turn right you can continue whatever nothing happens but you can't control the the brake control system in a way so it's very similar but the people learned that it's easy to handle this system and they decided the whole company decided to give the responsibility to their own employees so if you are freezing in your room you are responsible for yourself to handle that in another way and you have support on your working station by several informations that you can get and they can use so they proceeded in a way uh, to make the system more simple than it was in the first in the first building uh, the program is easy you have five floors five uh, storage if you want uh, we have an, uh, a ground floor with uh, a lot of technical rooms in the center of the plan surrounded by uh, entrance room hall cafe and whatever conference room and then in the next floor uh, you see some visualizations the next floor you have a hall an open hall in the in the center of the building like an interior house in the in the plan of the offices the offices are separated with glass walls so we they wanted to have a very open, very open, visually open system of uh, organization of rooms. An impression of the hall from uh, the from the first level, and then uh, up in fourth or fifth floor, you see some uh, uh, open space in the in the center of the building like here what is uh, what was our interest was to avoid now we have no technique we have no tubes no ventilation whatever that needs a lot of uh, dimensions to to guide that in the horizontal we have not suspending ceilings we have no hollow uh, uh, floors so uh, we decided to we wanted to have the materiality of the concrete of the construction material that we need for this for the bare loaded structure as well for the organization of the uh, primary rooms and also the ceilings are made uh, in this ripped texture in between in the valleys there is uh, implemented some some um, uh, acoustic materials that can absorb but not more so it's absolutely minimalized in a way that the surfaces are are from a hard surface from a hard quality even the floor is made by natural stone just now we decided to have natural stone earlier it was an industrial floor but the company wanted to have something uh, that fits to the materiality of the concrete so this is also visualization 
not the realization part. But it's clear, this is something contradictionary to that what you, are, uh, what you see every day if you have to do with office buildings. You are doing the core and somewhere is coming, somewhere is coming to fulfill all the surfaces that you have to suffer and somehow to organize in a way that is not really easy and not really a pleasure to do so. You see some impressions of the, of the office rooms. The system it was prefabricated pieces in uh, concrete. The arcs, as you saw in the model, are not arcs, but in effect they are uh, uh, T-shaped, uh, cantilevered uh, 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 consoles, and ceiling elements prefabricated as something like a, a lost formwork that was then integrated with a concrete inside. The connection to the facade outside, the facade is bare loaded. The climate is inside. We had to fulfill the insulation values for the ceiling. This is uh, high performance insulation on the outside. And the joints of the ceilings are only particularly to the, to the, to the arc construction. So every arc, uh, there is a small meter of connection of the ceiling. So we have there a controlled uh, bridge of uh, warmth and cold. And in between, it is cut off, uh, cut off and uh, uh, separated with insulation. So somehow, like a package around the whole ceiling construction. The effect is that we have around the whole facade something, uh, something very similar like the flaps. We have a controlled window uh, ventilation not controlled by a machine, by the people working there, but under support on the computer that they can uh, react in a way to, to have an appropriate climate in total. We are looking for the air coming from all sides and then we guide this air through the building, through the, uh, through the working rooms towards this uh, hall. This hall is uh, worked out like a big chimney and we can uh, uh, push the air, or let's say we can guide the air through the whole building and leave it away, uh, passing a heat exchanger on the roof. Very simple without any uh, complicated technique. This is what we are interested in because we see that more and more the costs are shifting towards uh, the technology of, uh, of the climate organization and we wanted to have uh, it more on the side of the quality of rooms as well as on the, on, on the construction itself. You see the building is under construction now, this is last week, it's not yet finished, I can't show you uh, uh, images from uh, the finished building. You see this is all the concrete and there is only adding now uh, the the, the floor material and the divisions of the working spaces with glass walls. Some impressions to give you an idea in which direction it could go. So somehow this helped us to prevent against uh, bad changes uh, while this building will become older and older. You never have an idea what happens, but somehow we could make, uh, we could find solutions to stabilize the whole uh, quality of the rooms in a way that people should work easily, should have fun to work there, but uh, we can avoid a lot of complicated and, uh, and uh, boring works one after one other in an in a additional thinking, an additional planning. We wanted to have something like an organic whole body of architecture, bringing that together, all these aspects together in several simple handling. So I'm proceeding and showing the last project. This is the work of ETH site, a group of students, uh, the Swiss Alpine Club as the client, and uh, in the middle, in the middle phase, I had to overtake 
uh, the, the work with my office because, again, of responsibility and guarantees that had to be fulfilled. But let's start in another way. First of all, uh, why, why, are, why is a university like ETH engaged in building a mountain hut or mountain cabin? But one has to know, a cabin, first of all, a cabin is only allowed to build by the SAC, Switzerland Swiss Alpine Club. It's the only organization that is allowed to build houses outside the building zones. And they have to make the proof that it is necessary. It is then necessary when there is a very famous peak where people want to climb up and they need to have a pit stop in between because they have to start very early in the morning, let's say three, three o'clock in the morning, they have to get up and climb up. So this famous peak is given, the name is Dufour Peak. It's the highest uh, peak in Switzerland, totally on the Swiss side. Uh, and this is, the, this is the reason why this cabin is needed, because of the alpinists first. On the other side, there was ETH with an anniversary, 150 years. Uh, there was a professor engaged in the whole ceremony questions. And there was an idea, I don't know from whom exactly it came, but there was an idea that ETH, the university or the Department of Architecture, could be engaged in uh, working out the project for a cabin. Because of what? Because of, aha, one could show the technical uh, systems uh, from the several disciplines, one could bring together a lot of uh, 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 ideas from the research part to the application in practice. And uh, this is something very normal for architects because they're used to work in practice to find solutions even if the solutions are not yet uh, known on the research side, they have to handle somehow. I would say it's easy for an architectural theorist to say the problem is complex, but that does not help for architects. They have to, ha they have to, to, to work out the problem. And so uh, sometimes uh, 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 we can say it's also a professional deformation that we always think that every problem has a solution. But however, this is the, the area this is this, this famous peak here, Dufour Spitze, Dufour Peak. This is uh, the glacier. This is the so-called Grenz Glacier, Border Glacier, and the Monte Rosa Glacier here. This is uh, the Corner Grat. This is a long, long uh, uh, railway uh, leading up to this, to this point here, to this peak. And this is Zermatt, a famous uh, touristic village. And on this side, you are looking here on this point. Uh, this is the famous Matterhorn. So, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, for Switzerland. It's an uh, important touristic region. You see in the background the Matterhorn down there in the dust, Zermatt, the glacier, and uh, you see the Dufour Peak. So this is on the on the on the map, and this is in reality. Uh, so. This is this famous peak. Oh. Yeah, very, very small now. This is the glacier. And if you're looking very close to the picture, this is the old cabin. Okay. So somewhere in the snow and ice. This was exactly the point why uh, somehow, first I, I was hesitating, but then I became fascinated by the question, okay, this is really like um, Robinson Crusoe somehow. So you have to work out with students the question, how would you build a house at a place where you have uh, a lot of time snow and ice, you have no street there, uh, you have to organize everything uh, to live there in a way that uh, yeah, in effect, what, what is that, a house? And I thought this could be a nice provocation to the, to the studio. We founded the Studio Monterosa with uh, 12 students 
and we started uh, in a competitional way over four semesters. This is the group of the students. We, have to go th we had to go there with ski and, and walking and even uh, one time with a helicopter. So some, somehow to find out what is happening, what can we do, what could be the, the problematic, what are the important parameters to, to look at and so on. And the students, it's clear, they realized it could be, there is the danger that it could be realized. We had no money at all, absolutely no money at that point, but a lot of enthusiastic students. We started with 12 projects. Every student, first semester, every student made a project. There was a jury of specialists and members of the SAC and so on and ETH. The jury selected the six better conceptions as preconditions and base for the second semester and 12 students continued. Every two students on the same base, but in their own work. So at the end of the second semester, we had again 12 proceeded projects. There was a jury. They selected the four better solutions. The four better solutions became preconditioned of the third semester. And a team of three students were working together on the same base. So we had at the end of the third semester four projects. And then we had again the jury. They selected the two, betters, the two best ones. In the meantime, a lot of uh, help was added. I mean, it was like in an in a, in a architectural office. There were specialists, civil engineer, building physics, physician, uh, building technologies, all that things that the students had to learn to handle that whole disciplines together to bring out uh, an organic uh, project. And uh, so in the end, uh, there were two groups of six students in a team working out the project. And you see a lot of trial and error. We said it is allowed to be a thief, to take the better idea, to learn from that, and to proceed if you know why. And you see a lot of interventions, a lot of uh, proposals, but what, it, what came out was not a, a direct line of a project. It was the, it was the best summary of, of the best advantages of different projects. Because one team uh, became very, they came in a bad state. So they, they came to an end where they realized we are in a dead end. We have no proceeding anymore, but we have a lot of good ideas. We have to take over, we have to rethink the project and to reorganize our team, and then we, we try out from zero what we have learned, fitting that together and assembling all this knowledge to a new project. And it was really uh, a situation of uh, uh, desperation. And they brought up this project and they won. And this project uh, was only a visualization in that state, but this visualization helped because suddenly a lot of people said, okay, it could be really possible to realize such a project. It's only a visualization, it's a Fata Morgana. It's not more than a, a nice picture, but it helped. And it was important to proceed to look for the money, for sponsors, and so on. So what is the idea of this project? Is first, the first approach is very simple. The students found out that in that situation, they need to have uh, a small footprint, they need to have a dense package of rooms to have uh, the lesser possible surface uh, you can get because of the whole uh, climate handling, the inside, the outside. You have outside sometimes minus 20, 30 degrees. You have wind until around 200 uh, kilometers an hour can be possible. You have on the other side sunshine until uh, 40 degrees in summer, so you have a, a huge range. You have no water. You have to look for what, what, where you take the water. You have no electricity, what that. You have no warm water, how to deal with that, and so on, so on. So they decided to make a, something like a sphere. And if it would be easy to build spheres, the world would be full of that. That's clear. 
it's obviously not so easy, so they cut, uh, they cut the project in, in plain elements to get plain elements to how, uh, that they can put together. And then, if you cut an orange, you see the radial organization of the room. So this is the, the model, let's say, the, 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 the construction or the, the structural model behind uh, the project. On, one si on the other side, the students began to think about how to organize the rooms. There are a lot of rooms. People shall stay there overnight. There has to be a restaurant with a kitchen. And, uh, uh, and several other uh, uh, service rooms as well. It's clear the students were totally fascinated about containers. They said, okay, we are doing rooms like containers, one piece, and we take the biggest helicopter, and then we take these containers and we put, assemble them together and we have to build. And um, they invited the pilot. They had contact with the pilot. They invited the pilot of this big helicopter, and pilot came, and he looked to this model and then said, okay, you know, I have a big helicopter. What shall I do according to your mind? I said, okay, we need to have someone who is transporting this, these containers, and then we need someone who is putting these containers together. So the helicopter is not only transportation vehicle, it's, it's, it's a crane as well. And then uh, the pilot uh, took a piece of... Uh, uh, of, uh, how do you say, schnur, uh, uh, some, some, some nylon, whatever, uh, a small load, he played the helicopter and said, look what happens. He gave the student this, uh, this pendle and said, okay, now try to hit exactly this point here on this uh, paper, but exactly. And imagine we are now in the scale 1 to 200 or 1 to 100. A student tried very, very... So, not move, not move, not move, not move. Absolutely impossible. The pilot laughed and said, look, this is two, three meters what is happening on site. Absolutely impossible. And if I have, because I have to hang the load 100 meters under the helicopter, I cannot hang it closer to the helicopter because of the downwash of the rotor. If I would hang the load 20 meters under the helicopter while I'm flying, the whole load is damaged, smashed down. So, I need to have 100 meters that the load is coming to the site without any damage. But then I'm not a crane. And so the students learned very easily, but this is only an example I'm telling, but this was really uh, shocking the students. They, they, they learned that they have to cut off the whole building in the smallest possible pieces. So pieces of walls, pieces of ceilings, and taking the smallest helicopter only hanging the load 20 meters under the helicopter, but then they could use the helicopter as a crane. So, concerning to the fact, otherwise they would have to have a crane, and they knew that the costs are important, so the students were provoked with everything. Costs, how to organize the, the, the building site. Some students said, okay, let's dig uh, together stones, and we are making a stone house. Would be easy. The SAC has a lot of members. The SSC answered, nice idea, but we have no slaves. Okay. Or uh, let's make a funicular from the building side to the corner grad. They had a specialist for funicular construction. He was there. We calculated all too expensive. So at the end, it came out that the helicopter was the only fitting transportation and crane vehicle with, uh, let's say, affordable costs. The costs in totals for transportation were a third of the whole building cost. So every kilo was important. That leads to another question, how to construct this? But first of that, probably the most important sketch is this. This is the staircase. Staircase like a spiral. It begins the entrance of the building, winter room. The hut is always open, even if there is no people there. You can enter because if you are failing, in a, if you are missing in a storm, you have to find uh, protection. So the hut is always open. There is a winter room, and then you can walk up uh, the cascade uh, in the periphery of the building. This is the restaurant. 
This is the level that gives the maximum footprint according to the need of the restaurant and the kitchen. And then climbing up, you will reach three floors of rooms. This spiral is interesting because it's not only a staircase, it's not only uh, a nice panorama view that you have from that point, but on the other side, it's also the mouse trap, the light trap of the building. The sun is shining in from the morning until the evening directly in this spiral uh, staircase and is producing heat. And the heat is physically climbing up the staircase until the top, so we, we can or we could then with a the, with the simple technique uh, collect together the warm air and bring it through all rooms through the building down to a heat exchanger and then again away out of the building. So this is uh, 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 an, an invention that is made once but causes a lot of, of, of more values in this building. We have so much warmth, now after two years of, uh, of usage, we have so much warmth that, uh, that the gardener of the hut is allowed to open the windows and let it out. If he can't use it anymore, he can open the windows to, to waste this warmth. This is the effective, and I show that because this is only architectural intervention. This is only architectural intervention, this is not technique in that sense, it's not building technique, it's that what we are dealing with. Windows, glass, wood, and openings, and the organization, the conception of the rooms. So then we have to overtake, you see a working model in a, in a phase where we had to professionalize the whole procedures because of the guarantees, uh, ETH is not able to do so, so we had to overtook to, to, to be contractors in that sense. What you see, what was worked out uh, is a construction, is a timber construction. It looks very complicated, it's like a, a Röntgen uh, picture. You don't see the, the closings of the elements, you see the structural parts of every element. It's uh, more or less a complicated construction, as you see, uh, a, com a difficult geometrical uh, uh, confusion. If you are looking close, you see here a rectangular shield. This will be the place where the photovoltaics are uh, positioned. Photovoltaics are rectangular. And the other right angle you have in the building is that between ceilings and walls here. So you see a very regular uh, division of the rooms. This is absolutely regular, geometrically regular, while the outside is like the cutting off of uh, a system of uh, star-like uh, organized walls. Oh. These walls, and then on the outside cut off what you don't need to make the minimum of the volumetry. The house is standing on a, a pillar construction because it has to lift away from the terrain. This is all rock. It looks like earth, but it is all rock, and very fine uh, pebbles and so on. We had to fix the house to the terrain because it is so lightweight that with 200 kilometers an hour wind, the house would blown away. So we had to fix the house. It's not heavy enough to stay there self-standing. And on the other side, uh, we needed a, diff, uh, a distance to the, to the terrain because of the permafrost underneath in the rock. Uh, if you put the house directly on the, on the terrain, it would melt. And this is absolutely catastrophic because then the whole ground becomes unstable. This is the place that was selected because of this small area here. It looks not really spectacular, but this is something like the smallest part we could find as more or less horizontal a terrace for the restaurant. All other places are, are, are slopey or stiff, whatever, in a way that you can't use it. So it was this small place as a reason for positioning the building here and the other one was that we could collect 
the, the melting water from the glaciers very easily uh, 200, 300 meters above the hut uh, with a drainage, special drainage system. The technical floor, the basement, where the main entrance is, the ground floor, the restaurant, the kitchen, the terrace is the money maker, absolutely important. Student tried to organize the student, uh, the terrace uh, on the roof, some tried to make it on the roof and found out that it absolutely does not work because the guardian then needs two uh, people more for the service. So they had even to control uh, the facility costs and not only the building costs. And then three floors in frame construction, timber construction. High insulation, 30 centimeters is not so much because uh, we can uh, use the warmth we get in in a way that we have a nice balance between inside and outside. Everything uh, prefabricated in timber construction. Some impressions of the working place of the entrepreneur. Here again, driving the machine, the computer and the robot, we can cut off the wood in a way that we can make joints directly wood to wood in a way that the positioning of the pieces is easy. You, have, you don't have to measure, for example. This is absolutely important to hold the cost uh, down. The filling of insulation and so on as you see and know it. Surface of the building, a thin, rough aluminum uh, sheet. You see the black field, this is the photovoltaic part, the roof and uh, the envelope of the facade. And you see the window band starting with the restaurant and then according the cascade. And you see also small openings for the rooms where the bedrooms, the sleeping parts are. Outside the working model, some impressions from the building site, staircase covered with uh, fire protection uh, material. This was also important. This is the, it was to bring through the administration. So we had another professor specialist for fire protection conception at, uh, on the side of the civil engineers, he had to go to Bern to the government to persuade that it is possible to build a sixth floor height hotel. It was named hotel, this was forbidden then, but uh, it, it, it fall under the same normative uh, uh, preconditions like a hotel. And so we had to find out if it is possible to get the permission. The people had to think along long time about that and they said, okay, we are doing that this way. 30 minutes for the people to leave the building, everyone gets a sleeping bag and then the hut burns down. It's easy if you are there, and if it's bad weather and so on, people would survive, they can warm as long as the hut is burning <laughs> and, and after that they go in the sleeping bag. But there is no road to come here no chance to do something else. So it was really new solutions in, a, in any direction. Some impressions from the finish. And you see it's, it has become more or less a little bit also like a watchtower in an alpine region. You see the small windows and the band, the materiality. So uh, not only a technical question, not only a question of using uh, timber construction and all that uh, f building physics stuff. At least the question was always what is an SAC hut? What is that? Uh, related to the, to the question of typologies or to the questions like, uh, like which tradition uh, one will follow. And you could imagine that it was really hard in between SAC the conservative part of this whole experimentation and ETH running for the experimentation and research. This was uh, uh, often not easy to gap for us and we were in the middle of both. Both sides banked and, and hit on us to, to bring out something that uh, could uh, uh, 
uh, estimated from both sides. So what you see at least a film, it's a film of the main sponsor. I shortened it, <laughs> but you will feel that it's a sponsor on one side, on the other side it's a strange sponsor because it has nothing to do with timber construction, but a lot of interest in question of uh, yeah, how would you organize a building in a more or less self-standing way? The breathtaking setting of the Monte Rosa Range and the majestic aspect of the Matterhorn are entrancingly beautiful. From time immemorial, they have held mountaineers and hikers spellbound. These glacial landscapes have been around for millennia. People who enjoy and protect these glaciers have a special duty. They must ensure that development is sustainable so that future generations will also have a piece of unspoiled nature to appreciate. Sustainability is also a guiding principle for Holcim. We take responsible use of natural resources very seriously. Only those who live with nature and protect it can live from it in the long term. Holcim quarries stone to produce cement, gravel and concrete. We put a lot of effort into creating new habitats for flora and fauna in areas where we have mined. Holcim is geared up for innovation. We invest in new environmentally friendly building materials and sponsor pioneering projects such as the new Monte Rosa Hut. This is the site for the rock crystal, 100 meters above the old Caban du Mont Rose. It took six years to plan and a construction team has been working here since June. The new Monte Rosa hut will be a high-tech construction and a model of sustainability. It represents a collaboration between ETH Zurich and the Swiss Alpine Club SAC, supported by Holcim and other partners. The rock is hard and time is short. The construction workers install the concrete core to a series of sockets in the rock. The foundation must be in place before the onset of winter. Construction will then start next year. Twelve days later on the site and the concrete foundation has been completed. Now the steel construction engineers are at work assembling the steel grid, the actual foundation. The new Monte Rosa hut will then be built on the steel construction next year using prefabricated timber sections. But before that, the long alpine winter will descend. Spring 2009. Master carpenter Egon Buman makes a visit and site managers and architects for the new Monte Rosa hut exchange progress reports. On his computer in the office, Bruno Schacher draws the building elements of the hut, every single one. He receives the planning data digitally from ETH Zurich. The Monte Rosa hut will be six stories high, built from 420 prefabricated timber elements. It will be almost self-sufficient in energy thanks to the very latest technology. Sustainability is the watchword, from construction to operation. The computer sends the data to the machine. It simulates the cut, quick check, then produces the element from Valet Spruce, accurate to the millimeter. Production has been running at full speed since the beginning of March. Floor and wall elements are assembled and lined with insulation mats, and pipes are laid. Getting the materials to the building site and assembly will place heavy demands on logistics and the weather has to cooperate. Still four weeks to go before construction can begin. The construction workers are optimistic. The building site presents itself in early morning light. Day two of construction starts. Here is the star-shaped steel grid that will form the foundation for the timber construction. Yesterday the builders cleared the site of two meters of snow. Today, the timber elements for the basement will be flown in and assembled. Everything must go quickly. Time is money.
Every nine minutes, the helicopter takes the floor elements from Riffelborden to the building site, each one weighing more than 400 kilos. Like the pieces of a jigsaw, they're fitted precisely into the steel grid. By noon, the inner circle of the floor has been laid. In the afternoon, the helicopter brings the outer floor elements. Cooperation between the carpenters, pilots and flight personnel is perfect. It's tough precision work at almost 3,000 meters. At 4 o'clock, the last of the 20 elements has been placed. Foreman Martin Bornett checks the measurements. Then at 11.30, the K-Max, a special helicopter for heavy loads, brings the first wall. Beneath the rope dangles 1,720 kilos. Assembly takes two hours. At 1.45, the last of the ten basement walls is finally in place. The basic structure of the Monte Rosa hut is up, just three days after the construction began. Four weeks have passed since our last visit to the construction site. The workers have now hoisted five stories and the outer walls have been erected. Around 20 craftsmen are at work here now. Window fitters are now putting in the windows, specially made to withstand the raging storms that often sweep over the peaks up here. The joiners are now working on the interior. The basic structure of the first floor cafeteria with its timber beams is complete. The row of windows that acts as a light and energy trap is also in place. It's Friday morning at ETH Zurich. Andrea de Plazas and his colleagues plan the next steps. It's now all about the details, color scheme, door handles and carpeting. Andrea de Plazas and his team have produced the design for the new Monte Rosa hut with their architectural students at ETH Zurich. But what do they aim to achieve? The mountain hut as such was not actually that interesting for me, but I liked the idea of a building in a place that of course cannot be linked to civilization in any way, or at least not to the extent that we are used to in the city. In other words, no drainage, no water, no electricity. All these requirements cannot be taken for granted. So the students had to deal again with the question of what a building actually is. How does it work? Where do we get these things that we need every day? And of course I'm certain, I'm sticking my neck out here, that it will be the best mountain hut that you have ever seen. The short mountain summer draws to a close, but there's still intense activity on the Monte Rosa building site. Metal workers add the facade, a demanding task. The protective aluminium sheathing must withstand wind and frost. And one day, it will make the building glisten like rock crystal. The in-house power plant is almost ready. A hundred solar panels on the south-facing facade will supply the house with electricity from sunlight. Now the site manager has to be everywhere at once. It's true that everything is being done right now. We have more than 30 people working on the site. We are getting things ready for the painters, putting up fire-resistant panelling and preparing the kitchen for fitting. Doors and beds are being installed. It's the final phase. Dawn over the Monte Rosa Massif. The new hut is still in the shade of the 4,000 metre peak. The scaffolding was recently removed. It's 8 a.m. and the start of the last day of construction. The terrace is still not complete. The carpenters fit the last planks. The final spurt on the building site. Only a few hours to go until the hut opens. What's the last thing now for you to do? The very last thing is to clear up, clean and generally organize everything. 
And is it a success? Has everything gone well up to today? I haven't discovered anything wrong so far. I have walked through the building a few times already, but everything appears to be as it should be, according to the plans. We also take a tour of the building. We take the cascading staircase to the upper stories. The washrooms. The hut has 14 wash basins and four showers. There are 18 rooms in the hut with beds for 120 people. Still 29 hours to go to the opening. Work is complete. A sunny autumn day begins. The new Monte Rosa hut is complete and will be opened in five hours. The tables in the large dining hall are laid. Around 100 invited guests are expected to arrive in the afternoon and will be the first to spend the night in the new Monte Rosa hut. This laboratory was financed with the help of sponsors who paid two-thirds of the more than the six million francs it cost to build. Meinrad Erbeler, he launched the project in 2005 to mark ETH Zurich's jubilee. What does he hope to see the new hut achieve? This project will motivate many people to come more often to the mountains and find pleasure in the world up here. It will ensure that the technologies in the building will be used in more projects. And I hope too, of course, that aesthetics will play a greater role in buildings in future. The rock crystal shines. The new Monte Rosa hut glistens. It is a masterpiece of Swiss engineering and a symbol for the country's innovative power. It opens a whole new chapter in Swiss Alpine building. ETH, the Confederation and Cantons, companies and private patrons have made this breakthrough possible. Thank you very much for your patience and your interest.